grace. We say grace at, at our meal every day uh, in the evening. And with Bo's here, our grandkid, he loves to do it as a cheer, which is fine with me. Grace. You know, there's, there's all kinds of multifaceted understandings of the word grace. There's a graceful movement, an elegance of movement. Oh, she dances with such grace. There's the courteous goodwill grace. Well, at least he had the grace to admit he was wrong. Then there's the legal. She has three days of grace period. And then there's the, the short meal, that, the short prayer before meal that I mentioned. That I really love that grace. And then there's the description of royalty, her grace, or, or maybe a, a, a pope, his grace. But the one I want to talk about is today is that one that comes from the Jewish and Christian understanding, which is uh, unmerited favor of God, mercy, pardon, reprieve. What is this? Huh. I'll tell you, that's what I want our conversation to get around today because even that understanding is multivalent. It's multifaceted. Uh, it seems to me that sometimes what we mistake where the, the gods of random sink line up, we call it grace. An opening happens. Could it be that uh, grace is just a mere consequence of a, a, a moment of these gods of random sink? Could grace be, as Carlos Castaneda said, a cubic centimeter of chance that pops out? Uh, is, is it some statistical thing that, that of luck and then we interpret it as grace? You know, the odds of me being here, of any of us being here, are literally trillions to one. Think about that. So for me, when I step outside, especially here in, with the autumn air, and I take a deep breath, I feel grace. I feel something that, that is undeserved, if you will. And yet, it's not the same grace. The Roman Catholics, which is where a lot of our understandings come from, see grace as a supernatural act uh, for the undeserved. You know, this, the whole concept of, <clears throat> of grace, it cannot be earned within that model, if you will. God's favor. Also, grace is the love of God. You see, there's no reasons God should love human beings, but it's God's nature to love, and that's grace. Now, there's also what's called divine grace, divine influence uh, to influence uh, the, the virtuous impulses, this, this, this part of us that, that something intercedes uh, and it allows us to be stronger. It allows us to endure trials and resist temptation. That's called divine grace. That's this, this peace in us that's circling around. And mostly I'm going from the Judaic Christian stuff here. Um, in Buddhism, uh, merit is everything because of karma. But in the 12th century, I think it was, uh, a Buddhist nun realized that if you were enlightened, you can literally take your good karma and lay it on other people and change their karma without them having to earn it. That's a form of grace in Buddhism. In Hinduism, I'll be honest, there's so much karma there that you really have to earn it. So what grace becomes is uh, an unconscious uh, goodness from your own earnings, if you will. And in Islam, it's pretty simple. Nobody gets to paradise by themselves. God is an integral piece of it. Um, and for me, I'll be honest, and this is just what I've come up with. Grace seems to be this gratitude of every breath. Somewhere there in thanksgiving and forgiveness is grace. And when I say forgiveness, <clears throat> I don't mean forgiveness from on high. Think about this. This was a scrap of paper found in the Ravensbrück concentration camp after it was liberated. This is <clears throat> word, word for word. <clears throat> oh Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill, but all those of ill will. But do not remember all the suffering they have inflicted upon us. Remember the fruits we have bought thanks to this suffering. 
our comradeship, our loyalty, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart, which has grown out of all of this. And then when it comes to judgment, let all the fruits we have borne be their forgiveness. That's so Jewish. Suffering is there to show us more deeply how to love. So there's a grace in the suffering. This is a lot. I just threw a lot out. This grace thing, it's amazing these moments that I feel graceful. Um, and it, it's, it, it's, it is undeserved. And yet at the same time, it's this part of being that is so unlikely. And when we realize that, how can we not feel uh, a bit of grace? So that's my shotgun blast. Marianne is coming from Spokane uh, Valley, Marianne Redis. And Bob Hayes is coming from Florida, uh, the land of tornadoes and uh, political tornadoes. Uh, Marianne, I'll open it to you first. What say ye on this uh, grace front? Well, I think for me, um, you know, I was raised Catholic, so my understanding of grace was um, kind of you touched on what the Catholics teach, that it's this unmerited gift from God um, that um, you, you cannot... Um, it's bestowed upon you. It's not something that is in your control. And I think, but my, I have a different understanding of it more on, I, I see grace as something that is, yes, it's unmerited, but it's also available to everyone. So it's kind of like the same idea that suffering is also unmerited and it happens in our lives um, unbidden. I think grace is, the, is the, the counter to that. And it's a connection with the divine energy. It's co a connection with all of us. It's that the love that runs through um, everything. And as we start to raise our consciousness and our vibration, then we have access or we are we we open our eyes to the grace that's all around us um you mentioned being able to go outside and take a breath and and that i think is something that comes from an awareness and a a raised consciousness and yes i do think that we can it is contagious and i think it can be um i don't know that it it's kind of like the karmic piece, but I think as our our ability to recognize and and accept grace into our lives, then we can be a conduit for others to be able to find and accept it as well. Amen. That's my shotgun. <laughs> no, I love that a lot, and that's insightful. Bob, how about you? Well, in my own philosophy that uh, I've developed over the years, there's several major influences. Probably the most influential is Carl Jung's theories of how the mind and how we're connected to the universe works. Along with that is my feelings of kinship with the Taoist tradition, which is trying to find a way to become one with the flow of the universe. And then third is that whole concept of flow. How do we get into, whether it's playing sports or whether it's an intellectual pursuit or whatever, that we can find ourselves in the flow without trying to be in the flow. And I think that when I try and combine all of those three, the thing that, that that keeps us from being in the flow or receiving grace, if you want to use those terms, is the complexes and the, the barriers that we have put up ourselves due to our experiences. And it's when we can open ourselves 
by putting by removing those barriers, possibly unconsciously, possibly consciously, um, that we're open to the flow of energy from the universe, or as Jung described it, the unconscious. And all of these other labels, I believe, are just different labels from different traditions that are describing the same thing. How do we open ourselves to the energy that is flowing from the universe to us and through us? And that's kind of how I look at grace. Wow. And you know, both of you uh, created a a graceful moment in me by sharing that because it seems to me as Mary Ann was saying, that uh, whatever it is, it's ever-present, we're surrounded by it, and it's available to all of us. And what it says to me is it's an opening. It's an opening that we can create uh, and at least co-create in ourselves uh, that we're more open to this 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 uh, grace. And Bob, what, what I heard from you is the word accord kept coming into mind. When we move with the oneness of being, that allows us, uh, that allows the opening to grace to be available. Uh, And it seems to me then that grace is, although maybe undeserved, because I don't know what I did to deserve to be here. What does, you know, even if you go through the whole karmic thing, what does anybody deserve? I mean, how? You know, did it come because we were bad and so we had to incarnate and work it off? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, That's part of the great mystery that we've been talking about. But the whole concept of grace being available to all, that there is an opening that we we can access grace through, and that opening itself is moving in accord with the Tao or whatever. When I was reading on the Buddhisms in the 12th century monk who said that I can take my merit if I'm enlightened enough. In other words, if I'm in accord enough, I can meet other people in their place where they're in accord, even if they're oscillating in and out of it slowly uh, or uh, not very often. I can share what I have with them. Uh, and, you know, Marianne, last week when you were talking about uh, Carolyn Mice's uh, stuff, I was thinking the same thing, that we can share it. And that itself uh, creates an opening uh, to whatever this mysterious alignment called grace is. Because something's aligning to me uh, when I think of grace. I don't know what it is. but Well, and I think there's also an element of faith involved too that you have to you have to believe that there is that grace exists in order f- to access it and i can remember a time in my life where and it was a complete visual where i was in high str- high distress and i literally turned myself around and faced another way and I felt something come through me that um, was unasked for, um, undeserved, but it completely brought peace and calm into the moment. And I, I think that I could have dismissed it and went right back to that distress, but I, it, it was that it, you talked about opening. It was an opening. And I walked through it when that opening yeah, yeah. appeared to me. Well, you and know, let me ask you a question in that. Uh, you mentioned that earlier that uh, we have to have we have to have faith in, before we can experience grace. And yet, it seems to me sometimes grace is what teaches us faith, like what you were just saying. Is that a, a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, um, I mean, you got to notice yes, because it because it, sure. defi- it was definitely wasn't something I was consciously thinking about. It wasn't anything that I, but I I do recognize that I could have dismissed it immediately, and, and instead of recognizing that this is something that's coming to me and it's real, and and being able to embrace that. Um, so I think it's not that I sat down and said, oh, I believe this, I believe that. It was more of 
um, uh, let me put it this way, recognizing the possibility of being able to see things in a different way. Yeah. And I, I was able to do that. And it was pure grace that, yeah. that came. Um, and so I, I feel like I've experienced it. Can I describe it adequately? Probably not as well as um, I can feel it. I can still feel it. Mm -hmm. um, and but but finding the the language for it is difficult. Yeah, and you know the the word that comes to my mind is noticing. You know, people experience stuff, but they don't notice it. They don't take note of what's really going on. And I think that that's part of learning to pay attention and learning a spiritual language that allows you to interpret some of these experiences. Yeah, and that, that spiritual language and, and the way you've described it, Marianne, is what I was trying to get at when I was talking about complexes. Uh, complex has taken on a, a negative connotation, but it's not. It's just the way that you're set up. It's the way that you have learned to interact with your, with your brain the way you've learned to perceive the world around you. And that consists of you defining it in certain ways. And so you have defined it in a way that that's, seems fairly elegant and, and, and seems to work. But someone else could define it in a totally different way and still experience that same flow, that same connection, but in their own terms. That's why I think you are so right on there. It's experience. It's something that we experience, not necessarily something that we can talk about and describe or give to another person. We have to find it ourselves. Yeah. Well, and you know, the word that, that Bob said, uh, grace as connection. Uh, when, we, when we have this moment of alignment, of accord, of moving with whatever the hell this big mystery of the universe is, uh, just for a split moment, that opening not just becomes available to us, but through that opening, we end up being connected to something much greater than ourselves. Maybe it's another person. Maybe it's your dog. Uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, a woman crossing the street. But it's, you know, ever since you said it's ever, ever present, Marianne, I've been kind of doing a, a review in my mind of all the little to, to, to kistoscopic moments where maybe grace had an opening to come through. And maybe grace is, when people talk about enlightenment and waking, maybe what the whole thing is, is even on the cross, you can experience the grace. Um. Uh, you know that. You know, I, I, and I think that's, I, I think another part of this too is that we can reject it, and for mm. me, that is our true choice. We can, and Bob, I think you talked about the things that we do that block that flow, that block us, and we can, we can reject it. We can turn away from it, um, and continue to suffer. And, you know, we go back to Freud's defense mechanisms, denial, intellectualization, rationalization. Those are two of my favorites. Uh, uh, you know, projection. Uh, it's real hard for me to, to project anymore because I get caught in my own projections and go, boy, is that me? <laughs> but this whole concept, you know, we're back to uh, being here now, being honest and uh, daring to be vulnerable so that we can experience that opening. And I believe that opening, Marianne, I think you nailed it. It's everywhere. It's the natural state of things. And human beings, and Bob, you know, you talk about blocking it. I think human beings have created a whole lot of ways to jam time up and uh, in, in that process to create uh, impediments to experiencing that openness. And I hate to say it, but dogmatic re religion is probably <laughs> one of the main things. If it's, you know, do dogmatic politics, dogmatic uh, religion, dogmatic science. Uh, if you don't believe science is dogmatic, go and study the positivists. Holy mackerel, was that a phase of science? Uh, 
Or try and get a new idea published. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, and, and Grace, there is a certain uh, luck quality that Grace comes to us it comes to us as, through as well. Uh, and, and I think that that's, you know, that is, uh, like with your experience, Marianne, what was it that really created that opening? What, what was it that allowed you for just a moment to put yourself in a, you know, in the stream of time in a way that, that was different? You know, what, what caused that? Uh, was it just, you were going through all your stuff and out of all your stuff, the probability of you coming across that opening was there and you came across it and noticed it. Is that, you know what I'm saying there? That's a good, that's a very good question. And I really, I don't know what, what happened. I don't know. All I know is that I, it was like things were lifted from the, so as you were talking just a few minutes ago about, um, I, I started to think of the whole idea of energy versus the physical. So when when we live in this place of possibilities, and I am by no, I, I feel inadequate to even bring this up, but I just read something about, uh, about it on Facebook, and you... Um, you guys would probably be able to explain it much better, but the whole idea of the wave and particle, so that when grace is the wave, and then when it solidifies, when you were talking about the dogmatic religion, and when it, it, it becomes something solid, then it, there's no more possibilities. But with grace, there's infinite possibilities. And so, and, and I think what happened for that one instance that I was talking about was I was in despair. I thought there was no way out. And yet I turned and I felt like there is, there's a possibility that everything will work out and be okay, that I will survive this. And so I think possibilities um, is part of it as well. Recognizing um, that nothing is permanent and, and is that grace? Um, I don't know. I think grace is facing all of that. Yeah. Uh, and the way it consolidates. And, I, you know, the way I've always said it is the, f the future is a wave and the past is a particle. And we are what makes that happen. We choose the waves. I think of the song Amazing Grace. We're talking about grace here. Newton was the captain of a slave ship. And he was reading, I think, the campus or somebody, some theologian, and he realized it was wrong. And he experienced a moment of grace. And he turned around, took all the slaves back, let them go. And he, of course, got fired and, you know, was never a sea captain again. But he wrote the, the words to Amazing Grace, uh, you know, how sweet the sound. And there's a piece of justice in my mind in grace uh, that is prevalent. Uh, I think whether it's a Mandela or a Newton or uh, anybody else, uh, you know, who, who's made a change, that there is a justice piece that is revealed in that opening. Uh, and maybe that's because of empathy. Maybe that opening is, uh, you know, a doorway to greater empathy and that creates justice. You know, Bob, we're back to the golden rule, do unto others as you would do them, have them do to you. That becomes real. And I mean real well, and enfleshed, a particle. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think I see grace as beyond justice. And, and the, the letter that you read from that Holocaust survivor that they found in the camp, I mean, that goes way beyond um, what is justice. Is it um, equalizing for everyone? Or a, he a higher level of justice. See, that's yeah. the thing. You know, we have such narrow viewpoints of what's really going on in the universe. And 
this energy that that flows through us it's like a fire hose that we have to limit by putting on these different kinds of, of uh, I want to say lens, but I'm, I'm jumping the different metaphor, whatever, whatever would limit the, and control the fire hose. Uh, those are the things that, that we have developed, whether it's defense mechanisms or whatever, because the energy is just too much for us. And the, when we, when all of those different things align, whether it's through despair, whether it's through activities, whether it's through any number of things, it opens that lens up a little bit so the energy can get through more, more fully. And that's the experience that we feel. And yeah, yeah. it goes away because we immediately shut it down. And by the way, none of this stuff is conscious, although we can make it more conscious through uh, different kinds of activities like meditation or prayer or good works. Uh, but ultimately, we're only getting as much as we can handle at the time. And maybe what really is what grace really is, is the ability to handle a little more of that energy than we were in yeah, the past. Yeah. And, 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 and our pressure valve. Yeah, and what you're you what go. I'm hearing also is that the energy is harmony itself. It's where things fit. So when I say justice, justice is really a state where everything is fitting and we all have the same gig. So if the energy is literally harmony, it's the harmony maker. It makes things work with each other. It takes the dissonance and makes them passing tones into something greater uh, in my musical metaphor. Uh, and, and, and to me, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of nice to think about that way. I hadn't really thought about harmony and justice, but justice is a, uh, you know, <laughs> that feels good in my soul. Thank you all. <laughs> well, and that gives me a, a, a good way to think about justice with grace, too, because... Um, you know, was it Vitchens, Vitzenstein? V- Wittgenstein. How do I say his name? V- v- Wittgenstein um, said, language is a tailor's shop where nothing fits. And, and our language is so, it limits that, that ability for us to be able to bring all that through. And every word carries so much connotation and so much, you know, on an individual basis and unconscious basis as well. And so, um, yeah, so that's, I, I like that. Well, and it gives a good understanding of why forgiveness is a big part of the grace of justice. Uh, you know, what Mandela did in South Africa, they could have, you know, in Tutu, they could have put a lot of people in jail, executed a lot of people. None of that happened. They understood there was an opening for forgiveness to actually land on fertile soil, and uh, to a large degree it did. And on that note, we're coming to the end of our our grace period. Uh, So, (laughs) Bob, final comments? Well, it's it's very confusing, like most of the (laughs) topics we we discuss at Deep End. Um, I just think that uh, openness... Uh, Marianne, you said it earlier, being willing to see that you have a choice, being willing to see that there are different ways of looking at things and that we can change our ways of looking at things, that's probably the most powerful tool that we can use to try and obtain grace. And uh, it's something that that uh, is, is part of, of each of our individual journeys. And the ultimate goal of all of our journeys is to achieve a state of grace. That's, that's the, that's the, that's the why of it all. Uh, So everybody just got to keep, keep moving along and keep trying to, to be as open as possible. Amen. Marianne, final comments. Well, you know, you say we need to keep going along and I, I think we we're trying to do our best and and to allow 
ourselves grace when we fail. And and when when I use the word in that way, it's it's tied, it's not really tied to forgiveness as much as it's tied to allowing for the possibilities that we can be harmonious, we can live in the flow, that there is some kind of um, connection between us all that we can tap into. And, and that, dare I say, love, you know, grace is, is the, that love connection and it is available. And when we can become aware that it is all around us and that it's our perception it's our way of seeing things that we can shift. That's the only thing we have control over. We don't have control over whether what's going to come our way, but we have control over how we are going to see it and think about it. Yeah. And so to me, that's an opening for grace. Wow. And, and I think that's what the whole gig is about, is that opening and where and when it's available. And I'll end by just saying this is Thanksgiving season. So for me, thanksgiving, forgiveness, those to me are huge elements of grace. And after today's conversation, well, I will say this, the whole concept of justice and harmony and how they relate to grace, oh, they're all part of it, aren't they? Just amazing to me. Uh, and I love our conversations because I get to come to some new understandings, some more gracious understandings. And if you listen to our conversations, you see that although we, we are probably pretty secular people at this point, we're very informed by the language of spirituality. And so next week, we're going to go to the changing language of spirituality as spirituality and science. We've talked about science and spirituality before, but we want to go and see how it is, um, I won't say infecting, but influencing the way we talk about our internal worlds, whether it's the computer and talking about, uh, you know, programming and bits and bytes and how we put our stuff, to, our minds together, or the language of viruses and bacteria and how they work creatively with each other. Oh my gosh, life is amazing. And science, what a lens. And that lens is showing us that spiritual evolution is happening in the way we talk about it. My friends, blessings in all you do.